All right, we're going to go ahead and kick this off. My name is Joe Pivarunas. I'm the founder and managing editor of Nanalyze. We're a boutique media and research firm that studies the merits of investing in disruptive technologies for a large global audience of institutional and retail investors. Today, I'm going to give a presentation titled Why We're Avoiding Ion Q. Now, prior to getting into that, I just wanted to clarify that we're very bullish on the quantum computing thesis. We're assuming that everybody who's going to watch this presentation already understands why quantum computing is exciting, why IonQ is an exciting story. It's the first publicly traded quantum computing stock. You've got a great team with a great pedigree, a lot of interesting partners, and there's a lot of potential in the company. The story's great, but we don't invest in stories. So today we're going to talk about why we're avoiding IonQ and what needs to change before we consider going long the stock. So wanted to start with a little interesting story. Our American readers, about half our audiences from America, would recognize this state. This is the state of Utah. It's quite a large place. I had a chance to go there last year and visit some of the national parks, and they're simply phenomenal. You can see some of them highlighted here. And when you're in Utah, you quickly realize just how big this state is. So imagine this. Imagine you drove a Volkswagen Beetle to the center of Utah and parked it right in the middle of Utah. So that Volkswagen Beetle would represent a nucleus of an atom. So as you know, everything around us is made up of atoms. So the building blocks of literally everything. So if you were to imagine an atom the size of Utah, the nucleus would simply be the size of a Volkswagen Beetle and everything outside of it would simply be nothing. So when people like Elon Musk talk about how we're living in a simulation, this is sort of what they're getting at. The world of physics is remarkably strange, and even the subject matter experts who try to describe it, who spend their lives studying it, can't properly describe it. So what problems we face when we're looking at investing in quantum computing is that there's a lot of funny stuff going on when you're supposed to invest in what you know, but even the subject matter experts don't know how to describe things. So a, an article we wrote about four years ago, four or five years ago, that was quite popular, looked at the Mandela effect. And if you're unfamiliar with that, what that is, it's quite interesting. A lot of people, for some reason, misremember, misremember a lot of things. So for example, Nelson Mandela, did he die in prison or not? And a lot of people think that he did, but he didn't. He actually died in December of 2013 outside of prison. So that was the example used to describe the effect where a lot of people misrep uh, remember the same thing. And one of the more outlandish theories as to why is that the scientists in CERN that are playing with particles, with the particle accelerator, have manipulated time and space. And now we're proceeding into multiverses where everything is different from what we remember. Now, that sounds rather kooky, and it probably is, but it isn't when you consider that the founders of D-Wave were giving a presentation not too long ago. This was back when D-Wave was considered to be a real uh, forerunner in the world of quantum computing, and they were talking about how they plan to go to other universes and extract energy from multiverses, and there's an audience of about 250 acclaimed scientists and investors that are just sitting there nodding their heads when they're talking about this stuff, and it just goes to show you how pie in the sky some of these ideas are, and that's why we need some sort of framework to be able to tell when we're making progress. And a gentleman over at Goldman Sachs who heads up their quantum computing research efforts put together this little chart that shows us some terms that should be familiar to some of you, quantum su supremacy. So the idea is that when a quantum computer can actually solve a problem that a classical computer can't, a big problem, then that's referred to as quantum supremacy. And then you have quantum advantage when a quantum computer can start to solve some practical problems that are of value. And then there's weak and strong, as you can see. So if, if we can only invest in what we know and understand, how can we possibly invest in quantum computing? Because even when you start to use these, this framework and you start to talk about quantum supremacy, there's a couple problems with that. For example, several years ago, Google claimed they achieved quantum su supremacy. Is it likely that they did? Well, a lot of critics said they didn't believe that. And then you also need to consider that whoever 
achieves quantum supremacy may not want the rest of the world to know about it. And that's that idea was was uh, formulated by Landon Downs at One Qubit when we spoke with him about quantum computing, and he proposed that the company that achieves quantum supremacy may want to keep that to themselves for a lot of reasons. Now, because it's so difficult to tell who's making progress because you have people lying or you have people doing things for marketing, IBM's famous for that. You have all these, all this information, all this noise. For a pure play stock, there's only one thing we care about and that's revenue, right? So we need to get past this science by press release and what, I, what example I wanted to give was a press release that IonQ put out about the work they're doing with Goldman Sachs. And it talked about uh, some progress they're making in Monte Carlo simulations using IonQ's hardware. And Goldman talked about, if you look at the verbiage that was used, a lot of it was you know, demonstrating viable approach, providing a roadmap to commercial usage, kind of paving the way to make progress. So milestones that are being made Certainly nothing that spoke of quantum supremacy. So, you know, you can read the paper and try to interpret that for yourself, but it's very difficult. What it comes down to is, will Goldman Sachs pay IonQ money to use their hardware? That's what it comes down to. Now, when IonQ talks about revenues, this slide was taken from their SPAC deck. And when we first looked at this, we assumed this was revenue growth. 5 million in 2021 and 15 million in 2022 and so on and so forth. But when you read the fine print and it really is in the fine print, it says that the revenue channels are still being defined and that they they haven't quite figured out how, how they'll record revenue. But the second bullet point is very important. It says revenue may include prepayments, bookings and recognized contracts. There's no accountant on the face of this planet that would consider bookings or contracts to be revenue. The revenue is only revenue when it's reflected as money that's been received by the company and is recorded as revenues and reported to the SEC as such. So for IonQ to put up this chart and to imply that we should consider bookings to be revenue is rather misleading and is somewhat of a, a check against them. Now, what QuantumQ has actually accomplished when it comes to revenue isn't much. And that's because they don't have a scalable quantum computer yet. The company's all but says so themselves. What they have deployed is their quantum computing as a service platform in 2020. And since they've deployed it, they have brought in $451,000 in revenue. You couldn't buy a studio apartment in California for that. So they've, they've brought in next to nothing for their platform so far. And that's after reporting the first three quarters of 2021. So that's one problem that they're not generating meaningful revenue but also we need to know where the revenues are coming from. We need to know actually who's giving the money to use the platform when the money that's being given is actually meaningful. Now, IonQ has $587 million in cash now, puts them in a very good position. They can survive for a long time. And that means that even if they're unable to generate meaningful revenue or show product market fit with their platform, that they can survive for a long time. So we want to be investing in companies that aren't just surviving, but are thriving. So when you look at the SEC filings, and it's very important for companies like IonQ, for any company in quantum computing or any sort of tech theme, you need to pay attention to what they're telling the SEC. All those glossy investor decks and all the marketing materials mean nothing. What they tell the SEC is what's meaningful and important. And if you take a look at their latest Q3, there's some very interesting information in there. One of the comments they make is this. They say that as of Q3 2021, they have about $16 million of revenue they expect to be recognized for non-cancelable contracts. So this is revenue that's, that's going to come in. And then they say, well, we expect to recognize $1.1 million of that this year. So you can take the 450,000 they already received and subtract that and that's what we're expecting for Q4 hopefully more and then they say next year in 2022 they're going to recognize 4.5 million more and then the rest of this 16 million dollars in the years after now if you go and continue searching through the uh, recently filed 10Q you'll come up 
across a section called related parties. And this is really interesting. So we, d we did a presentation on Ginkgo Bioworks and covered the concept of a related party. And here's how it works with IonQ. So the founders of IonQ, one used to work as a professor at Duke and one used to work as a professor at University of Maryland. And they took the intellectual property that they developed as academics and then they created this company. Now, just in September of 2021, they entered into a multi-year deal with the University of Maryland to provide quantum computing services and, and access to their facility in exchange for payments totaling $14 million. Now, neither of the founders, let's say both of the founders are currently working at Duke as professors. So they're not actually working at UMD. But the fact that an academic institution is giving them money to access their platform and one of the founders used to work as a professor there, isn't the sort of revenue that we're interested in. Would it be a whole different story if they said, well, we just signed this multi-year contract with, uh, contract with Goldman Sachs. Well, our, our ears are open for that. But when you start talking about you know, universities they've had a relationship with before that are giving them money, giving them funding in the form of revenues, like this starts to get, it starts to get a little bit questionable. So when we look at, revenues that IonQ is bringing in, we need to consider where they're coming from and why they're receiving those revenues. Now, once the company actually starts to achieve meaningful revenues, we use a rule, it's called a simple valuation ratio. Now, we don't invest in companies pre-revenue. They have to have meaningful revenue. This isn't just for IonQ, it's across the board. You have to have $10 million per annum or more. We consider that meaningful revenue. It's actually quite a small number. And once you have that revenue, we have a valuation re ratio we use, which is market cap divided by annualized revenues. And the way we calculate annualized revenues, we take the last quarter, multiply it by four. Now, what I've done here is put together what this ratio looks like for IonQ, given their current market, market cap of $3.2 billion. If they actually hit that $5 million of bookings or revenue or whatever they want to call it in 2021, then that would give them a ratio of 640. And you could see these numbers are up. So 2021, let's say that would be uh, 2022 here is, is supposed to be 2021. Then you have 2022 at a uh, revenue, bringing in revenues of 15 million, and that gives it a ratio of 213, and so on and so forth. The point being this, shares of IonQ, if they were able to achieve the $10 million in revenue, they would need to trade at $2.08 a share before we'd consider investing them. That's because we don't invest in any company with a simple valuation ratio greater than 40. And a lot of people will say, well, you're not getting in on the ground floor and you're going to miss out and it'll always be overvalued and all this other rubbish. Well, getting in on the ground floor is a myth. There's a number of reasons for that. So tech life cycles are decreasing. Technology comes to market a lot faster. We expect when we invest in a company that it's ready for commercialization. We don't wanna fund somebody's R&D. And, and technology is becoming very complex. So even if you're an expert through and through of a particular technology, you can still have a company that's trying to bring said technology to market and fail miserably. It happens all the time. So there's no way to assess, based on what a company tells you, the progress they're making, there's no way to assess how successful they're being with that particular technology. There's only one way that you can tell that they're able to commercialize and that's through revenues that proves product market fit. So this notion of, you know, well, we're gonna get on the ground floor. We just have to pay the overvalued price. The next Tesla bullshit is not gonna fly with any company. They have to be priced at a reasonable valuation and they have to be showing meaningful revenues. That's just across, that's for any company that we come across, that's the rule that we set. So we're not picking on I on Q, that's just how it is. Just because IonQ is the first quantum computing stock doesn't mean anything. First isn't always best, right? Others have followed. And unfortunately, they're SPACs and they run into the same information problem. But the other thing to consider here is that the world's biggest tech companies, four in particular, we're going to touch on in a second, have been researching and working on quantum computing now for over a decade, pumping billions of dollars into their projects. Plus, there's a lot happening that we don't know, what Rumsfeld calls the unknown unknowns. China probably being a good example of an unknown unknown. Who knows what, what the Chinese are getting up to when it comes to quantum computing, and they certainly aren't going to show their cards. So neither, I guess, will any of the, the private companies, and you see a list here, 
the competition. These are just some of the names. We've written 23 articles about quantum computing, one about IonQ. And in all those articles, we look at the players out there, and there are quite a few of them. And the four companies you see listed here, these are the OGs of quantum computing. Microsoft, you have Google that claimed quantum supremacy. You have IBM that always spins wheels on anything they do. And then you have Honeywell, which recently spun out their quantum computing venture with Cambridge Quantum Computing. And that's that's a pretty interesting one to watch. And then you have other private companies like Psi Quantum. They've They've raised, what, $650 million so far at a $3.5 billion valuation. So they're getting up to some pretty interesting stuff. There's a lot happening in quantum computing that needs to be taken into consideration when you evaluate the first publicly traded quantum computing stock, IonQ. And there are also a lot of newcomers coming on the scene. So you have, these are all companies from Europe and the UK that have recently taken funding and they're building hardware and software and all kinds of things. So when you think about quantum computing holistically, you need to consider the entire space and what's happening. So I wanted to sort of touch on the, um, the meme stock, stock types and I wanted to use this cartoon to sort of shed some light on how we all see things differently. And right now there's a lot of cheerleaders and promoters talking up stocks like IonQ in particular focused on quantum computing stocks and talking about how this is the next Microsoft, the next Tesla, the next NVIDIA, you pick your, your meme. And what these individuals, most who can't articulate their thoughts very well, they get quite angry when anybody offends their sacred cow. And what they need to realize is that, you know, echo chambers don't generate alpha. And a lot of these people are saying, well, I put all my cards on this one stock and I invested all my money and I made this big bet. Well, that's, you'd have to be pretty foolish to do that. So even if they actually did, if they were, if they were fool enough, if you're foolish enough to put all your money in one stock, you really ought to be open to hearing about what others think, the bear thesis, the red flag. So, so that you can understand both sides. So while we welcome comments and we welcome discussions around this, we don't welcome people who attack and, and try to shut down the story without considering what we're talking about. You know, we've written 2,600 articles and one is about IonQ. So there's a lot more to our message uh, about IonQ or, or than just this single company. It's about evaluating tech stocks in general. And no, we're not short. So we get accusations of that all the time. We don't short any stock. You'd have to be a fool to short because there's just a lot of irrationality in the market. So um, lastly, I wanted to touch on uh, a quantum advantage. Um, we were talking with a gentleman up in Vancouver, Landon Downs at One Qubit. We interviewed him a couple years ago, and and I had asked him, you know, what what excites you about what's going on in quantum computing right now? And he said he gave us this example. He said there's a researcher at Microsoft named Matthias Troyer, and he was working on solving a problem that it would take 30,000 years to solve. And he developed an algorithm that would solve it in 30 years. That's really remarkable, right? Well, then most recently, he announced that he developed an algorithm that can solve the same problem in minutes. So, you know, software eats the world. And we need to remember that it's not just about hardware. It's also about software. And if you're able to solve a problem that would have taken 30,000 years in minutes, that's a quantum advantage, What, regardless of whether you used software or hardware to do it. So um, the last thing I would say is, if you get a chance, take a look at the interview that we did with Landon. It's a couple of years old, but it's really interesting. He has a lot of insights, and in particular, this comment about quantum supremacy and, and perhaps that taking place without anybody knowing. So click this link and, and read this interview if you get a chance. The article's free. Do sign up to our YouTube channel. Subscribe. We'll be putting out more videos. And thank you so much for your time, for listening to this. And we'll look forward to doing more videos in the future. Thanks.